<clears throat> All my life you have been oh so good. Yeah, thank you very much. I've, I've been treated like a king down here. I'm not used to that. But uh, such a great place at the house. It's always been warm. It's always been clean. It's always been refreshing. And our, the board meetings have been good. Um, I've always tried to stretch people to the limit. And so we did that here. And our search committee was wonderful. We had a great time together. Um, Vicki planned to come this week, but um, we don't control our life. My grandson called a week ago today and said, uh, I'm going to be coming and staying with you Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. He's from Kansas City. He's at North Central University. And yesterday, and then Kirby's uh, assistant planned a party for him. His birthday was yesterday. She planned a party for him and invited 30 people, but she doesn't have a house. And my, and my daughter, daughter-in-law, they had three hockey games yesterday. So she said, we don't. And so they planned a party for our house with only 30 people coming. And no one planned any food. <laughs> so it was fun. But um, so, you know, my, my grandson's there now. If we can work it out, I'd like her to be here next week. But there's also a hockey game today. And my son's speaking at a, there we go, this one's better, Let's see, I never want to be yellow, it's okay, but, um, and so, um, my son is, uh, spoke last night in Cold Spring, and today he's in, uh, I don't know where he's at, so we always get to haul the kids around to church and other things, so, um, all kinds of surprises when you're a grandpa. And the nice part is, I usually get to pay. <laughs> when my dad was still alive, I said, you know, you're supposed to honor your parents, so I would take my dad out, and then the kids come by, and you take them out, and the grandkids, and it's just your turn, you know. But um, God has been oh so good. And so, um, still not broke. <laughs> uh, thank you for all, I see some cards around. Thank you very much for that. I, I'm, I don't, interns don't get goodbye parties. We forgot to tell you. <laughs> when pastor comes, Pastor and Annette will be coming this week. Um, they're going to build a ministry team some of the things that you're doing now, you'll continue to do. Some things they'll maybe add to you. Maybe they'll switch your responsibilities. But what Pastor Bob likes to do is find your gifts and then um, have you stay in the things that you love to do. You know, a lot of times in church, we just do things that no one else would do. We don't even like it, but we do it anyway. And then uh, all, all your life, you're doing an assignment. It isn't in your gift your gifts. Uh, Giftings, and so he's going to try to do that. I know that he'll try to um, stretch all of you. And um, so next week, they're moving in on Saturday. Uh, he and his son are coming down Friday night. Uh, some people are already lined up to uh, come at 9 o'clock. A lot of you are going to be here to help move in. And then um, he, because he's going to be busy that day, he, did, he wanted to be his best when he came to preach his first sermon, so he wants me to preach. And, and, so, uh, and so we'll be driving down Sunday morning because they'll be already in the house, and so uh, it's going to be a good time. And so, um, but there'll be some different things happening. He's, he's, a, he's a mover and a shaker, and he's going, to, uh, he's going to find your gifts, and he's going to... He, you know what? He's going to try to get everybody to do something. Hey, Mark, thanks for doing a driveway today. Yeah. Man, I, I've never seen a sweeper before. It must be a, you're leading the pack, <laughs> setting a pace. And so, um, so next Sunday, I'll be preaching in... Uh, with the pastor here, 
and I, I actually, I, I actually know what I want to preach on next Sunday already because I want I wanted to do something that would help him in his next step, and so um, today I'm going to do some foolish things. I like to do that. I make a fool out of myself a couple of times, but um, when I, I grew up in the church, do you ever? Did you guys ever have a scripture search? Do you know what that is? Scripture search. Okay, get your Bibles ready or your phones. Get your phones. I got a prize for someone that finds the verse first. I hate to have two, someone win twice, but it might happen. But we would have a scripture search when I was a kid. And um, everybody, we got points for 15 points for bringing our Bible. You know, they tried to do all kinds. And then on the scripture search, if you got a, if you made it to the scripture first, you got a little prize or something. But it was competition, so I liked it, you know. And um, I even liked it when I, when I would win. And so um, I actually ended up getting pretty good at it. I didn't realize I was actually learning something because when they'd have you read the verse, then they'd explain what it was. So you're learning something by accident. And I found out you can learn something every day if you're not careful. And so anyway, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a verse. Oh, anyway, I, I got a, I don't know what they gave me, but in, in, in first grade, they gave a prize out to everyone that could do the books of the Bible. So, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. I, I knew those in first grade. And so that's why the scripture hunt was fun. So get your Bibles out. And the first one, the first one to... Um, read it, is going to get to choose between two of my big presents. I, you think, you guys think I'm cheap. I, I bought these. I mean, these are, this is expensive. <laughs> okay, you got your Bibles ready? Now, if some of you don't like to do this, I don't care. <laughs> but anyway, so here we go. First verse, whoever stands and reads it, you get to choose between these two unbelievable prizes. So here it is. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16, verses 16 and 17. Who's going to be first? Stand up and read it, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Oh, here we go. Did you have it or? No, I'm kidding you. You know, this is just like when we were kids. Um, it was always competition, and somebody at Ed said, which one you want here, Eve? I don't know if you can have these before surgery or not. <laughs> There's always after. There. All right. Now, this one here is my last gift for today, but it's a crunch. And so, now, isn't this stupid? <laughs> But it can, it's kind of fun. Okay. Here's an Old Testament one now. Isaiah 40, verse 8. Stand up. I know these people that can type fast. I think you won. You like this? Good. We're going to have to discuss this during lunch. Oh, my goodness. This is what happened when I was a kid. <laughs> People did stuff like this. Well, then, you know, the school teachers and teachers were pretty smart back then, like they are today. And they were innovative, and they would come up with all kinds of stuff. And you chase people all over the Bible, and they would, and they would explain 
what the verses meant. And then sometimes they would bring a, a bag and you could pick out of the bag what they had and then you would have to use a scripture from what it was or, uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold, no one gets a prize for this, but what verse of scripture do you think of when you see this? You're the salt of the earth? Okay, this will be a little harder now. This one right here. What? It refers to being stirred up and shaken. Stir up the gift that is within you. Yeah. Yeah. I told you. Be crazy. Okay, bring out. But um, I thought it might be fun to uh, hopefully draw, also not just have fun, but to drive home a couple of truths this morning. I have one more thing in my bag. And I've been... I did a little survey this morning. You guys didn't know it, but I know that you have boots on. <laughs> so I brought my snow boot. This is what I use for shoveling. And man, this thing is over 30 years old. Look how good a shape it's in. <laughs> but you know, we're, we're um, there's a, this is winter, we still wear boots up here. Now, I, my, my grandkids won't, won't wear boots. Half the time they don't wear a coat. They wear shorts and a t-shirt when they go between hockey games and I don't understand it because I don't like to be cold. I mean, maybe I'm a softie, but um, boots. We all got boots. We have snow boots, we have knee boots, we have hiking boots, we have ski boots. We have army boots, we have rain boots, work boots, dress boots, and we have cowgirl boots and cowboy boots. We got all kinds of boots. And then we got the fancy boots that some of you have on, I noticed, but my wife likes, she likes boots that you really can't walk in or use very long, but they look nice. <laughs> I, I don't want a boot that you can't even walk in. Or you, and so, and so uh, I just make fun of her in front of her and behind her back. And so uh, I like comfort. I'd like, I like the, it, there's a boot called the, the, the walking boot. It's actually something you can walk in. And so that's kind of neat. Um, something about boots that, um, that, that um, remind me of a lot of things in, uh, you ever heard the comment, boots on the ground? Boots yeah. on the ground. A lot of people have adopted that. I think there's a picture of that boots on the ground. And um, it originated with the, uh, with the military and um, Bob and Annette are going to try to bring that here because you are the boots on the ground for this church. And um, so we're going to have a big team going on here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but in everyday language, uh, the boots on the ground are important in the political. The police have adopted it. The political world has adopted it. The, the business groups have ado adopted it. It's the physical people that are actually doing the work on the main location, and it's a very uh, sensitive issue and, and in church scenes all over the world in Minnesota and in um, the nationwide worldwide the Assemblies of God came up with the idea of having the indigenous church so you'd plant a church that could actually operate all by itself and that's what they call the boots on the ground and um, so we have this all over the world some of you have heard of boot camps there are all kinds of boot camps. I didn't even realize until I started doing a little bit of study. There's a fitness boot camp. There's a new dad's foot camp. Some of you missed that one. And uh, I should have gone to that. But then there's a, 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 there's a blogging boot camp, if you can believe that. There's a basic training that we know about for our military. And um, 
there's a church-wide, the church world has a boot camp for church planting. We would always, it costs about $3,000 for us to send every new church plant in Minnesota. While I, was past, while I was superintendent, we planted 175 churches in Minnesota, and everybody that was going to plant a church got to go to a boot camp. It cost us some bucks. And so we, they have pastoral boot camps. They have teachers training boot camps. They have youth, tra youth pastor, children's pastor, and we have a equip conference in Minnesota in April that um, Annette and Pastor Bob will be encouraging you to go to because it's going to be put on by the district at uh, Spring Lake Park at Emmanuel Christian Center boot camps. You hone your skills at a boot camp. You, you get new tools at a boot camp. You figure out how to make it, and, you're, and it's an upgrade. Now, my, my grandson, we have a picture of him, and I have, I have a, a recording that doesn't transfer to our system here. So if you just want to leave it at the first one for a minute, uh, Alec was assigned when he was uh, seven or eight years old. He was assigned by his teacher to do something that he, to write about what he's really good at. And he wrote out that he was an expert at pastoring. Because <laughs> his, his dad was a pastor. So here, he said, um, I'm an expert at pastoring. He said, if you're a pastor, you have to have a mic. Okay. And uh, if you're a pastor, you have to wear a suit. Back then, they had to wear suits. If you're a pastor, you should not fall off the stage. <laughs> he, was a pa he was an expert in, uh, you get to go out to eat with the missionaries if you're a pastor. Um, you get to do weddings, you get to do funerals, and, uh, and best of all, you uh, get to work all the time, he said. And so, uh, he can, and you work your best. So he, here, here's a picture of him at the, uh, at he had the last page, uh, Pastors by Alec St. John. Now, he actually ended up growing up, and um, Vicky and I were kind of excited about the fact that, yeah, he's got his microphone, he's got, a, got his suit on, and... Uh, we were excited that and it was kind of adorable that he was thinking about that at that age, but I, we never talked to our kids about ministry because we knew they wouldn't want to. But anyway, he, um, he uh, ended up, now he's at North Central, and um, he's got a guitar. I think we have, do we have a picture of his guitar? There he, he made that guitar this last summer, and so he's, he's kind of a crazy guy. Uh, he's attending the Assembly of God Pastoral Boot Camp at North Central University and um, told us he's coming to our house, so he's there now. But um, we're thankful that he's still marching with his boot camp shoes on and uh, whether he realizes it or not, um, God's going to help him in his future as he uh, continues to serve the Lord. Uh, uh, I wish he were a couple of years older. We could have Bob have him bring, come down and be our youth and music director, but it's not going to work. But um, when you and I uh, came to the Lord, we got our marching orders from the first time we were believers. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, helping the people learn, to be, uh, learn of me and believe in me and obey my words. You know, when you found the Lord, you just didn't find the Lord. He, he enlisted you in his army. And so some of you haven't been active enough. Some of you have been way too active. So Pastor Bob's going to try to balance that out a little bit. But um, uh, anyone besides me, I remember the old kid's song, um, I'm too young to... Um, or, or I may never march in the infantry... Remember that? Here's what we had to do back then. Okay. <clears throat> I'm too young to march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I'm too young to fly over the enemy. I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. I'm in the Lord's army. I'm too young to... Isn't that stupid? 
Don't you feel stupid doing it? Yeah, I do. <laughs> but um, God's enlisted us, and I just wanted to get your attention. You are, you are in God's army, so how are, you, how are you taking your marching orders? Are you doing, what are you doing for him in his uh, call to do? Now, now Vicky will say, you didn't do the actions to that course, did you? <laughs> yeah, I did. Military, the military people train and the Lord is trying to train us. What, what's he training you for today? He wants to stretch us. He wants to make us tougher than we've ever been before. He wants to put us, uh, put on the whole armor of God. And Paul, Paul wrote about the whole armor of God. And then right after that, here's what he said. And that's about, that about wraps it up. God is strong and he wants you strong. God wants you strong in his journey. And uh, do you think God is trying to make you better all the time? You know, sometimes we fail. And sometimes we get down on ourselves. But um, God's work is enabling us to be spiritually tough. And to, um, you've heard about the, fr the phrase, uh, tough as an old boot. Um, that, that idea is your body, mind, and spirit is tough as you try to serve the Lord. Um, when I was growing up, I thought it was kind of, you're kind of like a baby if you served the Lord. It was, wasn't a tough thing to do. Well, as I've been in the journey for a while, if you're really serving the Lord the way they should, you have to be tougher than uh, nails sometimes. And uh, Jeremiah, the, Lord's, the Lord wanted to help Jeremiah uh, become his great prophet and great leader. So he said, stand at attention while I prepare you for your work. And uh, here's what he said. I'm making you as impregnable as a castle, immovable as a steel post, as solid as a concrete wall. Um, you see, God is trying to get us at another level. And I want to ask the question, how much have you been growing in the Lord? How much have you been developing your spiritual muscles, so he can use you the way he wants to use you. Um, it doesn't mean that, that we're, um, sometimes we, we um, don't feel prepared. We don't feel equipped like we want to be. Uh, we don't know exactly what to do. Uh, have you ever felt like you weren't really ready for your job? Something the Lord's asked you to do. Um, sometimes we're not quite, ready someone put it this way he couldn't pour boot uh, he couldn't pour water out of his boot if he had if the instructions were written on the heel some people don't feel like they are ready for what they're called to do and uh, so then we become we become um, this of this we come so we're not as effective as we should be um, some people have been so discouraged, it feels like their heart has, is in their boots. Not that you change boots or you're, that you're in love with your boots, but that you, have you ever been so low that you felt you were on the bottom? That you had hit bottom on your process of living for the Lord? And so they have this, these boots, your heart is in your boots. And we have this, this boot thing coming up here. I think, there it is. Looks like hearts, but uh, I've been at some situations where I, I felt like I was, my heart was in the bottom and I had to have the Lord help me. And um, there are discouraging times that come to us. Um, some might be here this morning and you feel discouraged. Well, thanks for coming because the Lord wants to minister to you, wants that difficult place in your life. And uh, Job, uh, was an example of how to fight through the, all the impossible things that came to his life. Here's the questions he asked. As he was, all of his friends were around him making fun of him. He said this, do you think I have nerves of steel? Do you think I'm made of iron? Do you think I can pull myself up by my bootstraps? I don't even have any boots. That's from the message. Um, have you ever tripped up by your bootstraps? doesn't work very good, does it? Uh, 
In fact, I've never seen anyone do it. But anyway, um, the idea of being tough as an old boot and um, how, many, how many have ever heard the expression shaking in your boots? What's that mean? Scared to death. I've had a couple experiences in ministry that um, made me shake in my boots. Uh, a lady called me on a Saturday afternoon like I had nothing to do. And she said, um, my husband just left. She was at, her husband came to get her at a, at a friend's house and she was running away from him. He was an ex-convict and didn't, there wasn't supposed to have any guns, wasn't supposed to even get a speeding ticket. But um, those are the people that we like to reach. So they were in our church and she calls me up and she said, um, my husband's going to get some guns. Well, he went to get his wife and the guy knocked him off the porch. No, this guy's 6'6 and ex-con. I wouldn't try that if I were you. So he goes and he's gonna go get some guns. So she said, would you go stop him? I said, no problem. <laughs> so I get over there to the, they live in the trailer court. I get over there and he just threw two rifles or, on the floor of his car and he had a pistol on the, on the um, dash. And I said, um, Jim, what's up? Well, no one's going to keep me from my wife. They'll find out. So I said, well, let me come with. I said, why don't you just ride with me? He said, if you're going with, you're riding with me. So I get in there. And he slams his pistol on the dash, pointed at me, actually. And um, nobody's going to keep me from my wife. I said, well, let me help. So on the way over there, I said, Jim, let me explain to them the rules before someone gets hurt. No one needs to get hurt. Let me just go in and explain the rules. You tell me the rules, I'll go explain them. He said, okay. So we get there and he pulls up and he leaves the car in gear and gets out. And it's in a trailer court. He can't go very far without hitting something. So I thought I should probably stop this car. And so I you know, reach over and put it in park. And by the time I get to where he was, he shot two holes in the radiator of his wife's car. You're not going any place without me, blah, blah, blah. And then he, so I go in and we talk for a few minutes and he says, get in the car, take this car home and I'm gonna follow you. So if you, if you shoot in a trailer court, someone's probably gonna call the cops because it's kind of tight quarters. So we, he follows his wife and we're in the car behind him and the, and the police, they know, the police waved. <laughs> so got to the other trailer court where they lived, and he shoots all four tires off the car. And uh, so I follow him in the house, and his wife and kids are under the bed. Now, I got church tomorrow. I don't have time to spend the whole day there. But I, I better have time. And so... I said, Jim, the police are going to come. He said, and when they do, I'll be standing in the doorway, and if you don't get rid of them, I'm going to blast, blast their head off, you know, or whatever he said. I don't remember what he said. So I said, okay, it's a deal. So I'm walking out to the, meet the policemen, and they drive by real slow, turn around and come back, and they say, got everything under control, Reverend? And they don't even stop. So... So I go, in the, I go in the house and um, I was scared to death. What am I gonna do? What are we gonna? I said, Jim, just, I talk a lot better if you just put the guns down, you know, let's talk. Well, nobody got killed that day. I, I can't believe the lady stayed with them, but that's how enablers do it and so I thought that wasn't too bad. About three weeks later, some guy calls me at 11 o'clock at night. He said, I'm coming by the church at 2. I'm going to shoot myself. and my I'll get there at 10 to 2. My wife's coming at 2. I want her to see me. 
Well, you know what he's, I didn't think about this then, but what he's really saying is, can anybody stop me? But I wasn't thinking about that at the time. So I, I get out there at 10 to 2. He's out there. He's got his, sitting in the, he's got his gun against his head. He's got his thumb on the trigger. And I'm out here. If he pulls the trigger, we both get it. And, um, you know, my, as loud as I can yell, which isn't very loud probably, I said, um, I said, Tommy, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke this. And, and I said it as loud as I, I was yelling it. I rebuke the demon of suicide. And I started praying in the spirit. Now, we're only 100 feet from a trailer court. I don't know if I was waking people up or what. But then his wife drives up, and I said, you know, I don't know anything about guns. I said, Tommy, is there a clip in that gun? He said, yes. I said, give it to me right now. He he hands it to me, and uh, we go in with his wife, go into the office at the church. And within 40 minutes or so, I was able to take him to the hospital. But I was shaking in my boots. North Central Bible College has no courses training you how to do this. And uh, I probably, somebody else had courses in it, but I never, I never took them. But anyway, I lived through it. And so, but uh, when, when the children of Israel were always in a war of some sort, uh, and so Saul saw this, the Philistine troops come, it's, here's what the Bible says, when Saul, when Saul saw the Philistine troops come, he shook in his boots, scared to death. Um, I don't know why some people are, you know, he was supposed to be smarter than this, but even though he was going down the wrong road, doing the wrong thing, and he's shaking in his boots, he still, he still goes to the, the uh, witch of Endor and ask for directions. Some people never get it. If you get caught in a place and and the Lord helps you, um, don't keep doing the same thing you've always done. And um, I think of what the psalmist said when he got in trouble, instead of doing what Saul did, continued to sin. Here's what the psalmist says in Psalms 44, 25. And here we are, flat on our face in the dirt, held down by, the, by a boot on our neck. A terrible way to try to face your trials and t- terrible way to try to make it. But the next verse says, arise for our help and redeem us by your mercies. Uh, the psalmist always knew how to come to the Lord in his time of discouragement, in his heartache. And so um, time after time, God inter- intervened on behalf of the people of Israel when they would call upon him. It says that God, God remember us when we are down. Uh, His love never quits. Rescue us from the trampling boot. His love never quits. I don't know if um, how all these things come, but this is how Israel felt that they were being held down by the enemy and they were always sort of fighting oppression and problems. The boot of oppression uh, was threatening to trample them down and destroy them. Israel suffered under all kinds of uh, boots during their years of slavery with uh, Pharaoh and in Egypt. And it says, the Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help, and, and cried for help because of their slavery went up to God and God heard their groanings and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. So God looked on Israel and was concerned about them. Do you know God's concerned about you? He's concerned about what you're going through. He's concerned about your financial pressures. He's concerned about your marriage issues. He's concerned about your um, situation uh, with your kids. He's concerned about everything in your life because you're actually his child. And um, do you feel like you're a child of the Lord during your trials, during your heartache, during your... He wants, us to, he wants us to know that he's on our side and he's going to help us 
through the valley. Micah, the prophet, um, had a great history of knowing how God could help and God could help them. Micah chapter four, 7, verse 4. And, and, it, and the Lord said, I delivered you from the bad life in Egypt. I paid a good price to get you out of, there, out of slavery. I sent Moses uh, to lead you and Aaron and Marion to boot. I like that word, to boot. It means uh, in addition to or something like that. And so um, I just want to talk a little bit about when God found you, how bad were you when, when God found you? What kind of shape were you in? Uh, some of us were at our very wit's end when God found us. We were at our, almost an impossible place. And um, you know what happened? God didn't only save you, but he uh, delivered you. Some of you, I don't know if anyone in here was necessarily an alcoholic or a drug addict, but he not only saves you, but he delivers you. A lot of people, um, now you have your gambling money. You have your booze money. You uh, have all the things that God spared you from. You didn't only get saved, but there's a, there's a lot of things to boot that we got with it. And uh, when you come to Christ um, and you put him first, and I was just thinking when we keep taking these offerings up here, there's an unbelievable generosity. And, um, but some people have never learned the, the blessing of tithing. And um, I just challenge you to see if God can make more out of your 90% than you can out of the 100 and see how God helps you with that. Now, that, that wasn't in my notes, was it? <laughs> She's shaking her head, no. Okay, that's a taboo then. Just throw it in to boot. Uh, I love what Samuel said when he responded to the, the miraculous deliverance uh, of the Philistines. First Samuel chapter 7 described how the Philistines gathered and attacked the, uh, to attack just as the prophet was leading the uh, people in a, a spiritual revival of repentance and returning to the Lord. And, uh, and the enemy comes and it says, they pleaded with, with Samuel, pray with all your might and don't let up. Pray to, God, our, to pray to God, our God, not just your God, that he will save us from the boot of the Philistines. There was a miraculous and dramatic um, happening how God intervened. All through scripture, God miraculously intervened uh, you know, 300 people could kill a whole nation off. And I don't know, and I read about some of David's mighty men. They would, they, they would go and kill two, 300 people all by themselves. I don't understand that. But when God is on our side, something special happens. And um, uh, he, he said, so what Samuel did after that great meeting, Samuel took a single rock and he set it upright between Mezpah and Shen. And he named the place, he named it Ebenezer, the rock of help, saying, this marks the place where God helped us. So every time they went by there, they were encouraged by the fact that when they saw that rock, this is where God delivered us. Every, and, I, and I just have some questions for us. What are the things that you put in your life or what are the th things that you have in your life to remind you of the victories of yesterday? What, what are the things that you've set up so you can remember what God did for you in the past? Um, some people, um, in the Old Testament, they had all kinds of markers along the way that they remembered. Um, because uh, when they came to that place, it was like they were rebooting or booting up. And um, this, is what, this is how David booted up in discouraging times. When my soul is in the dumps. How many have ever had your soul in the dumps? I mean, that's, that's kind of low. And David probably had more stories of discouragement than any of us. Um, I rehearsed everything I know of you, God. When I'm really down, I started rehearsing everything I knew about God. And um, 
from the Jordan depths to the Hermon Heights, including Mount Mizbar. Um, I, I want to, in my life, have things set up so I can keep reminding myself how good God is and how much. And um, to be honest with you, one of my little stones that I'll have set up was my time in the Vern and uh, my going away party. You know, little things we set up. Because I always want to remember how good God was to me because I've had a lot of things in life where I haven't been so good to him. But um, when we start focusing on what God says instead of the neg negative circumstances, it's a reboot to the spiritual system. Um, how many spiritual systems need to be rebooted every once in a while? Um, every morning, um, I've, I've got something that I do on my phone, reading some scripture, and I can't figure out how to get out of it without rebooting. So every morning I reboot my phone. So I guess it's, I don't know if it's good for it or bad for it, but I want, I want to get rid of what I'm working on and go on to the next thing, and I don't know how to do it, so I just reboot. If anyone has any help. And see me after church, but um, a lot of people never reboot their spiritual systems. Um, something, did you ever notice things try to creep into your life? And um, what do you do with them? Um, sometimes we occasionally have to boot out something that's in the way. You see here a lady kicking this guy out of the... It reminded, it reminded me of when Nehemiah, when Nehemiah had um, came back to be in charge of building the walls and, and Eliashib had um, let Tobiah, a person that was an enemy of God, get in, actually live in the house of the Lord and in the courts of the house. And here's what it says uh, Nehemiah did. And I was greatly displeased and I threw or booted out all of Tobiah's, of Tobiah's household goods and uh, out of the room and I removed him. And he um, cleaned up the place. Um, if, if, there's a, if there's a virus on your phone or your computer, you gotta get rid of it somehow. A lot of things will slip into our life that shouldn't be there. And uh, I want to I wanna be on a cleansing process in my life. Um, there are things in your life that you shouldn't have. Fear, bitterness. You can't get better with bitterness. Jealousy. Well, that's the thing that the Lord tries to take out of our life. Unbelief. Uh, negative thinking. One thing that everybody should, including every person should, Get rid of unforgiveness. It'll never help you. And so um, boot it out. Get rid of it. And um, I'm going to skip a little bit down here. Uh, I had a friend that pastored in Minneapolis. In, in the, probably wasn't my great friend because he was a little older than me. But when I, was, when I was in the 60s and 70s, he was on TV every day for 15 minutes and he was called The Man with the Message. I don't know if you ever heard of him, but it was Gordon K. Peterson. He had a Souls Harbor Church in Minneapolis that ran about 1,000 in the 60s. And he was an amazing guy. So I had him come up. They had a, they had a um, campgrounds by, our, by, by Hibbing, only 18 miles away. And so I got to know him a little bit. And... Um, so I had him preach for me the last year I was in Hibbing and um, he was preaching away and he said, I have a dream of dying with my boots on. I thought, well, whatever. <laughs> and so within the next year and a half, he was preaching down south on a Sunday night service and he said, I am so tired. He sat down on a platform chair and died right in the middle of his message and he got to die with his boots on well I just want to say this we all want to end well we all want to end on top and so um, there are all kinds of things that keep us from 
uh, getting there. We want to finish well. But um, this is, a, this is a, a truth that you could bet your boots on if you were a gambler, but you're not, of course. But uh, the revelation said, Behold, I come quickly, and his reward is going to be with him. Now, when the... the um, the Western people or the TV movies, they give out a golden booth, golden boot to the guy that's the best for the year. It kind of looks like that. And then there's a soccer and the rugby shoe that they give away to the best uh, athlete. But um, God tell, God's word tells us that there's a reward for all of us. There's a reward for you. And uh, his reward is a crown of life. And the man who remains steadfast under the trials and when he has stood in the test, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord, uh, which God promised to those who love him. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of life, Paul said, a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Now in the world, all the competitions, only one person wins. But in God's family, everyone wins who's, fo who's following the Lord. It says this, and not to me only, but all those who love his appearing. I believe with all my heart there's a reward for everyone in this room as you stand before the Lord someday. And um, I want to respond the way I should, and I'm getting running out of time here. I, I want to come to the end. I'm going to skip a couple pages. And... Um, When we were kids, we used to sing, God's got an army marching through the land. Deliverance is a song and healing in the land, in, in their hand. There's an everlasting joy and gladness in our heart, but in God's army, I've got a part. Um, what's your part in God's army? So I, I, just got, I just found the Lord. I didn't want to get in any army. I didn't want to be in any fights. I didn't want any, God wants you to, have a journey with him that, that's lasting and that makes a difference. And so um, I want to just say this in closing. It doesn't matter if you're a seasoned um, soldier of the cross. God is calling you to the next chapter of your life. Um, I don't care if you're fresh out of boot camp. You're needed in the Lord's work. I don't care if you're a new recruit. Some of you are just being recruited and some of you haven't enlisted yet maybe. The Lord is trying to get you to follow him. And um, I believe with all my heart that this church is on a journey uh, that's going to explode in the next two or three years as he gets on board. And so um, I just want to, I want to pray that God would use all of us that it, the way he wants to as the music team comes and we're going to have a, a closing uh, we're not quite there yet. No, I want that next though. What you just had, okay? I um, I want to thank the Lord for recruiting me. I want to thank the Lord for recruiting you. I want to thank the Lord for that all of us are needed. Everyone in this room is needed for the kingdom. And uh, I really think the Lord wants to give all of us marching orders. And um, I'm thankful that God has a place for you. And um, I believe as we come, you know, we talk about the church not being very uh, effective sometimes or we think that at the end all the government regulations that could come and all that stuff but I see the church on the march and you can go to that one <laughs> sorry I goof her up and she still smiles at me thank you Babe. so I'd like us to stand and um, I believe that we're going to we're going to be an army to march for the Lord as um, as He uh, gives you the assignment when Pastor Bob comes. 
Now you go and have the words for this song, but um, as we leave today, it's going to be a little diff different way to leave, but as we leave today, the girls are going to be singing, uh, and we're marching out to our assignment. Okay, can you envision that? You guys ready? And we... We speed it up a little bit, and, and it was funny. At first, we sang it with one speed, and we were singing it because it's an old, old song, as, as old as me. And, but then we speed it up, and it was funny. As soon as we speed it up, every one of us wanted to march. Feel free. But these are the words. You don't have it, but it's very easy. You're a smart group. You'll learn it. I hear the sound of the army of the Lord. I hear the sound of the army of the Lord. Sound of praise, sound of war. The army of the Lord, the army of the Lord, the army of the Lord is marching on. Amen. This is our marching orders. Amen. Amen. Amen.